everyone. I'm Margaret Hart. I work on the YouTube music team based in Nashville, Tennessee. Today, I have the distinct honor of interviewing a true living legend, Miss Reba McIntyre. So let's run through a few of the incredible achievements Reba has had over her 50 year career in the music and entertainment industry. She has had 35 number one singles and sold over 58 million albums in her five decades in the music industry. You will also recognize her from hit her hit TV show, Reba, and maybe even from her time on Broadway and Annie Get Your Gun. But wait, there's more. Yes, more. Reba recently opened her first restaurant in Oklahoma called Reba's Place and has a clothing line with Dillard's and a boot line with Justin's. And she's currently a coach on The Voice, which you can watch on Mondays and Tuesdays on NBC. However, all those things are awesome. We're here today um, to talk about her latest book and album release, Not That Fancy. The book is a joyful collection of stories, recipes, and just great reminders for living a good life. The album is a beautiful collection of acoustic covers of some of her biggest hits, and she even has a few friends that show up on the album. So without further ado, please welcome Reba McIntyre. Hi, Margaret. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are all so excited to have you here. Um, so let's dig in. Okay. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Okay. So let's start at the beginning. Can you tell us a little bit about where you grew up and a little bit about your upbringing? Sure. I grew up in southeastern Oklahoma, a little bitty town called Chalky, and there were six people in my family. I was the third out of four kids. I wasn't the oldest, wasn't the youngest, and I wasn't the only boy. So I was in that third <laughs> slot, which was uh, mostly invisible. So I was singing a lot to try to get that good attention. But it was on a working cattle ranch. My father was a rodeo cowboy, as his father was. So most of us kids, everybody but my little sister Susie, uh, we competed in the rodeos. And growing up, I loved to compete in the rodeos. I loved basketball. Um, little bitty small town that I went to school, Kiowa, Oklahoma, 18 in my graduating class, went to college. Southeastern State University, and I majored in elementary education. Awesome. Got my start in the music business in 75, but before that, we were singing as the singing McIntyres, my older oh. brother, Pake, and my little sister, Susie, and I. We started that um, junior high, high school, had a great time doing that, and that's pretty much what got me into singing. Uh, then, um, when I was in college, I got the opportunity to sing the national anthem at the National Finals Rodeo in Oklahoma City. And a gentleman heard me sing the national anthem. His name's Red Stegall. And he took me to Nashville and we cut a demonstration tape. And 11 months, months after singing the national anthem, I had a contract with Polygram Mercury Records. So it was kind of a Cinderella story there. Oh, my gosh. I love it. Now, wait, OK. What kind of music were the singing McIntyre singing? Oh, country music and gospel. We okay. uh, we covered a lot of the singing Rambo's music, but it was Merle Haggard, Ronnie Millsap, Dolly Parton, Loretta Lynn, Tammy Wynette type songs. Oh my gosh, I love it. Now, um, having the privilege of working in Nashville, um, we lovingly like to call our town a 10 year town, which means from the day you arrive, it's, it's 10 years to success if you're lucky. Um, so did you have a hit overnight? once you got to Nashville or did it take a minute? Oh my gosh. No. <laughs> what happened was uh, my first single was released in 1976. And the name of it was, I don't want to be a one night stand. Ironic. I know I didn't have a number one single until 1983. So during that time I got the education music yeah. 101 because I didn't know anything about the music business. I came from a rodeo ranching family. And so, um, I thought, this was how ignorant I was, I thought if you had a single on the radio, you were rich. You know, you're going to have a tour bus the next day. Well, mm -hmm. that definitely wasn't what it was. When I was touring, I was in, oh, pickup and campers and had all of our equipment mm -hmm. in a horse trailer behind us. And then we moved up to a matching van with a 
matching trailer. And finally, in 82, I did get a bus. It was uh, totally used and broke down every day. Mm -hmm. And so it was um, it was baby steps. And I mm -hmm. had a lot of great teachers, not only with Red Stegall, who helped me, but other people in the um, at the record label managers. And so that spanned from 76 to 83. Um, it was just small baby steps and yeah. awful lot of education, learning how the music business runs. Because as I said, I knew absolutely nothing about it. Yeah, there's a lot to know. There um, is. This, this leads very sim seamlessly into one of my favorite quotes in the book. Um, and you say that the flip side of fear isn't fearlessness, it's curiosity. Can you talk to us a little bit about how curiosity has served and guided you in your 50 year career in the music entertainment industry and beyond? Well, sometimes ignorance is bliss. And when you don't really know what you're getting into, but you're very curious about it, mm -hmm. move forward. And if you're not curious, well, then you're intimidated and your, uh, your insecurities start popping up. So right. as I said, I was just curious. Um, yeah. I, I think curiosity has gotten me to where I am today uh, mm -hmm. in the sense of let's try it out. I mean, what do we have yeah. to lose? Uh, well, what if you fail? Well, at least we tried. Yeah. Um, I've always been a firm believer. Uh, sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. And it, there's not a bad thing about a mistake. If, if you learn from it, it was meant to be, and you have progressed. If you make a mistake and chastise yourself and never improve, uh, then why was the mistake there? I learned from my mistakes. I've made tons of mistakes in my life, but I see them as growing pains and I learn from them. I love it. All right. So we're going to get into the book just a little bit. Um, so it's such a just beautiful and, and truly joyful collection of entertaining and how you love the people in your life, your family and your chosen family. What, what was the inspiration for putting this book together? Well, it was uh, not my idea. Uh, they had come to me uh, to say, would you like to do a coffee table lifestyle book? And I was kind of like, I don't know, because I'd already done an autobiography. Right. And then they asked me to do a part two. And I said, absolutely not. I don't want to talk about myself. And so then I put out a little book that had funny stories. The name mm -hmm. of it was Comfort from a Country Quilt. And I enjoyed that. It was just yeah. a little storytelling book. Mm -hmm. And then when they came to me about this lifestyle book, they showed me Dolly Parton's and Reese Witherspoon's, Witherspoon's uh, mm -hmm. book. And I thought, man, that's really interesting. I, I absolutely loved it because it was a mixture of recipes. It was a cookbook, a lifestyle book. Um, and we're going to put a lot of stories that I hadn't told in my autobiography or that I had told in public. And a lot of other little tips of how to throw a party, things to see in Nashville, New York. Um, talk a lot about my faith uh, in this book, where I grew up and how I grew up how I talked to God. And then uh, I definitely wanted pictures for the recipes because I want to know what it's going to look like when I get through. Yes. That's, that's pretty important. <laughs> yes, very much agreed. Now, a lot of the recipes are from Reba's Place, which recently opened, I think in January of this year. How, yes. how has your first restaurant gone? It, well, it, it's going really well. It's a small town in southeastern Oklahoma, Atoka. Just uh, 12 miles south from where I grew up in Chalky. And it's a uh, three story building on Main Street. Uh -huh. And so 15,000 square feet. And we have a, we're having a blast with it. The food is excellent. Um, everybody, even the locals, are loving it. And people will make it a destination from states. Um, Gosh, we've had people come in from Pennsylvania just to come to the restaurant. That was their destination to check it out. So we're very proud of it. We have merchandise. We have Mama's Library in the third floor. Because when Mama passed in March of 2020, she had books in every room of her house. And we didn't have any place to put them. All of us kids had taken a bunch. And so we made a portion of the third floor of the restaurant into Mama's Library. And it's a real touching added part to the restaurant that I totally enjoy. Oh, I love that. Okay. So it seems like you spend a fair amount of time with your family. When everyone is together, 
what's your go-to? What are what are y'all doing? What what happens first when everyone gets there? What are your favorite recipes to put on the table? What does it look like when Reba's family gets together? Well, usually we're eating. Yeah. We can find uh, any excuse to go eat. And that's where we gather around a table and we visit or we're outside visiting. But it's everything from catching up what's been going on with the kids, grandkids, great grandkids. Uh, how you feeling? Of course, that always comes into play when you meet with family. How are you feeling? Uh, how's your ailments and how's that big toe, whatever. <laughs> but it's it's catching up. It's kind of like riding a bicycle. You take up where you left off. And we're very tight knit family. Uh, Alice Pake and Susie and I text all the time. We're calling each other. Um, it's especially since this new single that we have out called Seven Minutes in Heaven and the videos about Mama. If I had seven minutes in heaven, I'd, I'd mm -hmm. want to spend it with Mama. And um, that's that's another thing that, you know, just draws us closer together is music. So we love to sing. We love to be together and sing. And that's just uh, part of our heritage and growing up because Mama taught us all how to sing. Mm -hmm. So family, food and music, that's what goes together with the McIntyres. I love it. Now you talk a bit about playing games in your book. Is there, mm -hmm. is there a family game where the like real competitive spirit of your crew comes out? Oh, definitely. We're all very, <laughs> very, very competitive. Um, sometimes in a very playful way, but always very competitive and we all want to win. Uh, Fake was notorious to, uh, you know, hang in there. I don't care how late it is, how tired we are. Mm -hmm. If Fake is has not won a game yet. We're going to play till Pake wins and we usually let him win so we can go to bed. Go to bed. Yeah. That's the way it was when we were growing up. But daddy had three rules. You don't count your money in the daytime. You don't play cards in the daytime and you don't watch television in the daytime. You were working. Good You're rules. supposed to be working. Yeah. And then at nighttime after uh, supper, Dinner was lunch and supper was the evening yep. meal. Uh, we'd come in and uh, after us girls had cleaned up the kitchen uh, of the meal that mama had prepared, we all got in the living room and we watched television. Yep. Mom and daddy always had a bunch of friends that would come over and play a domino game named Moon. And so I guess that's where they got that rule about only at nighttime can you play games. But we're very competitive. My favorite games right now is Rummy Cube and Sky Joe. Okay. Well, I don't know that second one. I'm going to have well, to look that one up. Uh, my nieces, Autumn Calamity and Chisholm, introduced uh, all of us to that game when we were on a girl trip one time in Austin. It's a lot of fun. Anybody can play. And it's uh, and you can also visit while you're playing, which is very important. It's it's a key element of any oh, game absolutely. is that you can catch up as you play it and maybe have a cocktail as you play it as well. You'd have also to. Very important. Multitasking. Yes. yes. <laughs> now, a personal question from the book. There are a lot of sauces in the book, and I love sauces. My family makes fun of me for how much I dip things in other things. Do you have a favorite sauce? There are like three barbecue sauces in there. It's amazing. I think, the, I think my favorite sauce in all of the book is uh, Chef Curtis's um, ranch dressing. Okay. All I'm right. not a ranch dressing fan until yeah. I had Chef Curtis's. Okay. He makes it from scratch. As a lot of the dishes at Reba's restaurant is, you know, they, they're, you know, like chicken fried steak, yeah. um, smashed potatoes with oh. garlic and caramelized onions, stuff like that. But there's no um, preservatives in the food. They make all the bread, the crackers, the pickles, everything. Oh, um, it's homemade. So there's, oh you, know, you, you don't gain that extra weight. So come on down and have some really good home cooked meals it is right there on the place cooked not brought in not out of a bag uh, you'll enjoy it if you ever get to go to Atoka, oklahoma that's a-t-o-k-a atoka yep and it's it's right over the texas border into oklahoma uh -huh. okay. Yep. okay yeah right over it's north of the border love it all right so we're gonna shift gears just a little bit and talk about the album for a minute okay. so um the tracks are all acoustic they're absolutely beautiful. Um, some of some of your biggest hits. You worked with some pretty incredible people on this one. Tell us a little bit about Not That Fancy, the album. Well, the reason why there's not that much instrumentation and big production is because it is called Not That Fancy. These songs were recorded originally with big production, full band, 
sometimes bringing an orchestra in. And so mm -hmm. we wanted to really scale down, make it not yeah. that fancy. So there's probably five instruments on the songs. And we chose the songs that the fans wanted to listen to. Yeah. And we put it out there. I said, what songs are your favorites? And the ones that we hadn't put on the remixed, revised, and revisited uh, trio package, we put that on this album yeah. and added a new song or two. And one of them is Seven Minutes in Heaven. Oh, the video is beautiful. I mean, just, it is such, yes, <laughs> get the Kleenex box out. It will, yeah. it will definitely, definitely make you tear up, but it is just an absolutely incredible video. And Thank that you. song, I'm so I'm so glad it was yeah included on this collection. It's really really beautiful. Um, and then a couple a couple of small little artists are on the album with you. Just a little a few small artists you worked with. Well, when we were going to redo uh, "Does He Love You," we started putting everybody's name down. Who do you want to mm -hmm. sing "Does He Love You" with you yeah. on this round? And yeah. when somebody said Dolly, I said Dolly Parton. That's my vote. <laughs> Please. And it was during, <clears throat> excuse me, it was during the pandemic, yeah, kind of on the tail end of it, when we were recording. And so Dolly and I didn't get to be together when we were recording the song, but we did get to be together, as you can see on the video, which was a huge thrill for me. And a funny story about that, um, I I like to get to where I'm going, whether I'm working or whatever, early. If on time, you're late. So yeah. I'm always a stickler about being there early. And I was on my way to the um, the place where we were going to shoot the video with Dolly. And I got a call and they said, oh, your trailer generator just broke down. And so you have no air conditioning. So we went to my office instead and got ready, got all the glam ready. Uh -huh. And when I pulled in, uh, Dolly was already there. And we were going to shoot a lot of my stuff first, but that's who I oh learned gosh. from. It's Dolly Parton. Wow. She's always too, but man, I wanted to meet her there so I could welcome oh. her and, and, you know, be the oh, professional gosh. that she is. And then that's who I learned from. Oh, I love that. Now, yeah. um, you talk a little bit about the book of just kind of um, uh, the country genre has not always been um, the most female dominated genre of them all. Um, and it hasn't been the easiest place a lot of times for um, females not only to break in, but to have success and, um, and and to kind of find others that look like them and and really, um, so for, for you, you talk about how you wanna leave it better for the next generation of women mm -hmm. in this genre and in the music industry. And it sounds like you've had a lot of, lot of inspiration and in those that came ahead of you. What does that look like for you to kind of leave it better for the next generation of women and, and kind of, what does that look like for you? Well, I think it's very important to give back. I think it's yeah. very important to teach as much as you can. Mm -hmm. The ladies before me, Patsy Cline, Dolly Parton, Loretta Lynn, Tammy Wynette, Barbara Mandrell, uh, and also the men I learned from. Uh, and also women like Minnie Pearl, who yeah. was always on the Grand Ole Opry, a comedian, very intelligent, regal woman who portrayed a kind of a country bumpkin woman, but she was pretty smart also. And so those are the women that paved the way for us. Mm -hmm. And I, I really stress it to my friends, the one, my girlfriend's coming up in this business, that is our job to improve any way we can our situation, being women in the world of, of business. Um, yeah. It came pretty easy for me in the fact that I grew up in a man's world. So mm -hmm. I knew coming into the music business, it is a man's world. You you don't bitch, you don't complain, you work right. harder, and you do the best you can. And he said, God gave you two ears, one mouth. Listen, learn. And when you speak, have your thoughts collected, take a deep breath, and move forward. But it's very important to make sure you know what you want and move forward. And a lot of people can tell you what you need to do, how you need to look. And at the beginning of my career, I'll admit, I had no idea what I was supposed to look like, sound like. But I had great teachers to help me find my voice, to find my look. And it basically, the finished product is exactly who I am. So that's when I'm the most comfortable is when I am me. I'm not a good liar. Can't remember what I said. It's better for me to speak <laughs> the truth. And it's best for me to just be honestly 
this is the way I look. No apologies. This is who I am. Yeah. Take me as I am or let me go, as they say. <laughs> I love that. And 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 I think it is, it's I think it's so important for that next generation of of female artists to hear that and and to hear it from someone like you and someone like Dolly who who've done it and they've lived it. So just such a I think just such a beautiful and important statement. Um you led me very naturally to uh, my favorite part in the book where you talk about your hair over the decades. It just made me giggle. It's so funny. Um, so um, your hair, your wardrobe, they've been pretty iconic over, over the years and, and they've ranged and they've obviously they've, they've grown up as you've grown up. How, um, how involved? have you been in your hair and your wardrobe? I mean, you have a line with Dillard's, you have a line with Justin's boots. Obviously, you've got a little bit of a fashion sense about you. How have you been involved in your own kind of evolution over the years with your own fashion and hair? Well, Margaret, that's a huge compliment. I grew up as, <laughs> I wore hand-me-downs oh. all my life. Yep. And so to for you to say the fashion thing, it's it's pretty funny. Um, but I did. I learned. I watched. I had tons of stylists that would dress me and get to know me. And it takes a long time for a stylist and an entertainer to gel because, you know, they they bring in stuff. You go, oh, I wouldn't wear that in my worst nightmare. But you got to be nice and say, oh, I don't think so. Well, let's try it on anyway. And you try it on and they go, oh, no. And I said, okay. You know, yeah. you know what feels good on you mm -hmm. and you feel what you have to have is confidence when you have clothes on. And I like to wear clothes that people go, oh, you look nice today. Not, oh, my God, where'd you get that dress? So it's got to be the dress doesn't wear you. You wear the dress. And so that's what I've learned from stylists mm -hmm. and stylists have learned from me. Yeah. So hairdos. Uh, that was trial and error. I wore my hair up in a ponytail all my life, playing basketball, no makeup. And then when you get with people who can make you look better, improve your look, you're like, oh, my gosh, this is what I want every day. Unfortunately, yes. I don't. That. But it, it was a process of elimination on the hair, the clothes. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one time, you know, I had so much hair and it would take two hours to do my hair. Um, we called it jacked up to Jesus. Uh -huh. Yeah, but the higher the hair, the closer to God. Yep, higher the hair, <laughs> closer to God. Absolutely, but it's it was uh, it's just something that you grow up with, yeah. learn from. Yeah, and I've had some great, great teachers, great stylists, great hair people, makeup people that I've learned from, and I appreciate them very, very much. I love it. I mean, some of your looks have been so good. You have worn them again a few decades later. Your red dress at the CMAs. Oh my gosh! Yeah. I mean, the the audience went wild once they realized what was happening. They were like, "Oh my god, she is in the red dress." So it was it was pretty fun to see the reaction. I think you might have paired it with some nice uh, red uh, spurs, though, instead of maybe the the heels that went with it before. Yeah, I can't take heels anymore. They're just, they hurt my feet way too much. <clears throat> and when I wore the red dress at the CMAs, gosh, I think I wore it in 95 with Linda Davis okay. singing Does He Love You? And a few years ago, I brought it back out for the anniversary. Uh -huh. And uh, when we went to do press, um, my stylist had uh, me some red house shoes to go with them. So I just shuffled on down to the to the yeah. press room. And of course, I had to show everybody my shoes. So well, yeah. that did make the press also. I mean, it was it was just an inspiration to all of us <laughs> suffering in heels at an award show. <laughs> and now I see people walking down the airport, down the halls in the airport yeah. with house shoes on. I thought, hmm, yeah. where'd that start? <laughs> Straight out of bed to the airport is, is yeah. very common these days, apparently. Uh -huh. Oh my goodness. I love it. Um, now, my family is from the Arkansas, the Northwest part of Arkansas. So we're oh, just yeah. over the border from you. Yeah. So some of your little phrases like piddling and that dog won't hunt and all the rest you listed had me laughing aloud because they're all phrases we have used at our own dining tables and gatherings for years. Um, oh, yeah. So I loved that part. It really made me laugh loud. Is there, is there one of those phrases you use often or that is like your family really knows like that's that's the one phrase you you always pull out? Well, Susie and I are piddlers. 
Okay. We love yeah. to get in the house. We have a day off not working. We'll clean out a closet and then we'll move something out of the closet to over there. And then you see something over there. Well, that's yeah. got to be taken care of. So you take it oh, to yeah. another room. Uh -huh. And that's the door disease. If you walk yeah. through a door, you don't remember what you were doing in the room before. Well, yeah. uh -huh. So um, you kind of track us from the piles that we've yeah. made. Just we're organized. Ahead. We've got our piles all laid out. Uh -huh. My gosh. Do you want to explain what Piddlin is to the group for anyone who might not be from okay. that region of the country? Piddlin is doing something that you find very important, but everything else, everybody else thinks it's wasteful time. It's Piddlin. I think it's mental therapy for Susie and me. Yes, I, mm -hmm. I, I absolutely think that is true. Yeah, oftentimes if I am left alone in the house, I am organizing things that never needed to be organized. No, nope. I've just because they've left me alone in the house. What else am I going to do? Yeah. And you don't throw anything away. You just reorganize. You just no, make you move it, it around. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's it, it makes perfect perfect sense. Yeah. Um. So you are a few weeks in as coach on the Voice. How's it going? It's going great. I'm I'm having the best time with John Legend, Gwen Stefani, and Niall Foran. Foran, right. they're what a group. Niall Horan, that's the way you say his last name. He is a hoot. I love Gwen. She's a princess, but down deep inside, she's just that little girl that loves to play dress up and mm -hmm. so talented, so sweet, so smart. She uh -huh. gives the best coach's advice. I went oh, to her one time and said, Gwen, I don't know what to say half the time. What do you do? She's, well, I've been doing this for seven seasons. Just relax, take a deep breath and talk to them like you've known them forever. Uh, About hell. And then no. John Legend, I mean, he majored in English. I didn't know anybody did that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that's why he's so smart. He has the English language down pat. He oh, is gosh. so smart. Yeah. And, and it's fun. I just, I'm blown away with the talent in the, in the, in the world. They've this we're on the 24th season and the talent. It, it's just crazy. Everybody mm -hmm. who walks on that stage can sing so well, mm -hmm. have such stage presence. And there's 16, 17 year old kids that are doing choreography and, and blocking on the stage. When I was their age, all I wanted to do was get a driver's license uh -huh. and are doing things in front of yes. millions of people. Yes. And it doesn't seem to phase them. What oh. a difference. What what a special experience that is! That is just we love seeing you on that stage. It's Thank incredible. You. Thank you. Um, all right. So if your your past is any indicator, I, I have a feeling you already have something cooked up for what's next. Can you tell us a little bit about what's what's coming up for you? Not that fancy is out. You're coaching on the Voice. What do you have your your eyes set on next? Well, Margaret, you know the the strikes with the writer's mm -hmm. strike and the actor's strike yeah. has really put a damper on future plans. So right. it's kind of hard to make a plan right now, now that the writer's strike is resolved. Now we're waiting yeah. on the other. Uh, everybody's fingers crossed and praying that it'll end quickly so we can get back to work. And we had projects lined up before, uh, had some movies, you know, working mm -hmm. on sitcom ideas. So um, other than that, I just wait on God to tell me what to do next. And he's always my greatest uh, planner, and oh. he's never let me down. I love that. Well, we can't wait to see what's next. Uh, most importantly, tune in on Mondays and Tuesdays to see Reba as a coach on The Voice. The Voice. <laughs> it's so much fun. <laughs> and don't forget, check out Not That Fancy, the book and the album available now. Um, both are just such a joy, as was this conversation. Thank you so much for being here with us today. This has really just been so much fun. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of the day. And thank you again for being here with us. Thank you, Margaret. And thanks, everybody, for watching. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you.